Good morning, First Church. My name is Lexi, and I'm one of the pastoral associates here. Whether you're worshiping at home, outside on a walk on this crisp fall day, with family or housemates, or just enjoying a gentle moment of Sabbath solitude today, know that we cherish your presence with us no matter where you are. Today's worship is led by members of our stewardship committee and has everything that you need to participate in worship, including hymn lyrics and words for our shared liturgy together. If you're watching this worship service during our 11 a.m. live YouTube premiere, we invite you to use the chat box to the right of this worship video where you can offer some hellos, some prayer requests, some words of peace to your siblings in Christ this morning. In the description below this worship video, you can find many helpful things, including a link to our bulletin announcements for this week to find out what we're doing here at First Church, as well as a link if you're feeling new to this congregation to fill out just so that we can get to know you a little bit better. And finally, before we start worshiping in earnest together, I have a fun fact to share First Church. There are so many ways people join us on Sundays when we use the YouTube premiere to worship with one another. Sometimes folks get to worship late, just like on a regular Sunday morning. After worship this morning, I invite you to go back to this video and click on it and see how many people joined us for worship today. It's a fun exercise. It reminds us that while maybe we all weren't able to start at the same time and be able to be picked up by the premiere views tracker together, that we are all tethered in the same spirit together in worship. Amen. Amen. Welcome to worship. My name is Stephen Weller, and I'm currently the chair of the stewardship committee here at First Church. The Stewardship Committee has been working together over the summer and fall to reflect on our church community, its ministry, its mission, and how to invite you to offer your pledges of financial support and time and, and effort to the life of our congregation for 2021. We'll be dedicating these pledges next Sunday. In our worship today, we are exploring a bit about what it means to be people of faith at this particular moment in our world, in our nation, and in our communities. So now as we prepare to worship, we invite you to center your spirit with a deep breath. If you have a candle nearby, join us now in lighting it together as we invite God into our hearts and homes. Let us pray. Holy God, you faithfully keep the promises you made to our ancestors and lead your people into the future, providing hospitality on the way. Help us who inherit the pilgrim life to journey faithfully at your command that we may be a band of disciples called to be sojourners in your service. Amen.
Siblings in the spirit, wherever you are, hear God's call to come together. Come together in this community of hope and healing. Come together in the spirit of wide open love. Come together in the presence of God. Come together and return to the source of grace, courage, and peace. Come together and share your hearts, your hope, and your gifts. Come together and let us worship God. Friends, what would it be like if we were to embark on a new journey, a new way of living our lives? What would it be like if we were to let go of our usual routines and risk something new? What would it be like if we were to relax into the trust that God will provide? In this silence, let us take a deep breath and trust in God's unconditional mercy. Let us pray for healing, pardon, and peace. Holy and beloved God, we give you thanks for this mid-November day, for its worries and its joy. Lead us into your sacred space, where we can confess our deepest fears and share our shortcomings as well as our success. Lead us into a place of quiet contemplation and bold hope. Holy God, during this season of harvest and preparation, 
lead us to trust that there will always be plenty so that we might release our grip, deepen our connection with you, and strengthen our relationships with one another. Always in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. God hears our prayers before we can even find the words. God knows what we need to receive, and God knows what we need to release, in order to find the freedom and peace that we seek. Share this good news now, and greet one another with the peace of Christ. Peace be with you, First Church. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, open our hearts and minds to your word to us this day. May the stories and struggles of our ancestors in faith teach us timeless truths and remind us that we are not alone as we seek to be your people in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The lectionary readings for this 24th Sunday after Pentecost are interesting, to say the least. The first reading is from the prophet Zephaniah. In the 7th century BCE, or before the Common Era, King Josiah sought a number of reforms in an effort to avert the downfall of the city. Zephaniah was one of his primary advisors, along with the prophets Huldah and Jeremiah, calling for a return to simplicity rather than the excesses of luxury. In the first of his three chapters, Zephaniah writes, At that time, I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the people who rest complacently on their dregs those who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good, nor will he do harm. Their wealth shall be plundered and their houses laid waste. Though they build houses, they shall not inhabit them. Though they plant vineyards, they shall not drink wine from them. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. Here ends our first reading. In the 25th chapter, Matthew writes, For it is as if someone, going on a journey, summoned his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, each according to his ability, and then he went away. The one who had received the five talents went off at once and traded with them, making five more talents. In the same way, the one who had the two talents made two more talents. But the one who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole in the ground and hid the owner's money. After a long time, the owner came and settled accounts with them. Then the one who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five more talents, saying, Sir, you handed over to me five talents. See, I've made five more talents. The owner said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share my happiness. And the one with the two talents also came forward, saying, Sir, you handed over to me two talents. See, I've made two more talents. The owner said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You've been trustworthy in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share my happiness. Then the one who had received the one talent also came forward, saying, Sir, I knew that you were harsh, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not scatter seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. 
But the owner replied, You wicked and lazy servant! You knew, did you, that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I did not scatter? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and on my return I would have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him, and give him give it to the one with the ten talents. For to all who have, more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who have nothing, even what they have will be taken away. As for this worthless servant, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here ends the Gospel reading. I have to say that there's a danger when a preacher only preaches a few times a year. For 14 years of my ministry before I came to First Church, I preached most every Sunday. There's a rhythm to that, a week-to-week -week narrative structured by the liturgical calendar and the lectionary cycles. But occasional preaching is different. Back when I was just starting out, in a position similar to the position that Jazz or Lexi and Carlisle have had, I preached a few times a year in Beverly, and after one of those early sermons, I met a few days later with my supervisor. He leaned back in his chair and he said, that was three very good sermons. Well, we have multiple things going on this week. It's getting close to the end of the liturgical year with Matthew's version of the parable of the talents. It's Stewardship Sunday as we explore what it means for us to financially support our church for the year ahead. There's the American election results, which are now clearer and various transitions are in progress. And 400 years ago, the Mayflower was on the horizon. Historical note here, the Julian calendar in 1620 was about 10 days behind the Gregorian calendar which is what we've used since 1752. So the Mayflower sighted land on November 9th, but that will actually be 400 years ago this next Thursday. So we haven't missed it. And then on top of all of this, stewardship, politics, and history. The threat of the pandemic looms even larger as the weather shifts from summer toward winter. That's five sermons right there. But instead of five sermons, I find that what gets interesting is looking at the intersection of these multiple strands. And I'd like to suggest that at the intersection of these issues for us today is the question, how do we decide to invest our lives? How do we spend our time, our money, and when do we put it all on the line? Please pray with me. Speak through me, God. Help my head to understand your word and my heart to know your love, that I might be your voice in this place and this time through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Five years ago, I had the opportunity to travel to Dartmouth, Devon in England and to learn about the sailing of the Mayflower from the British perspective in anticipation of this 400th anniversary. Over the summer, as planned events shifted to virtual programming, I've had the chance to take a virtual tour of Leiden in the Netherlands. I've listened in on lectures in London, Southampton, Dartmouth, and Plymouth, as well as our own Wampanoag Nation. On both sides of the Atlantic, we're learning about and naming the clash of cultures in the 17th century and the economic issues that led to so many to risk their lives to cross the ocean in search of a new life. Many of us learned a part of the story in school about how the voyage took longer than planned, 
The ship was crowded. There was a dangerous storm that blew them off course further north than they had expected. We learned that they came for religious freedom, landed on Plymouth Rock, and then had a feast with the Indians, according to Edward Winslow. But that's not till 1621, so we can wait to unpack that till next year. They sighted land at dawn on November 9th, 400 years ago next Thursday, and then tried for two days to get around Nantucket, almost shipwrecked, and decided to come back and tuck in there behind Provincetown, finding a safe harbor, while they figured out what to do. Because they were north of the 41st parallel, beyond the boundaries of the authority of the Virginia colony, they drafted their own agreement about how they would live together, which Dave Dyer will read for us a little bit later this morning. They would govern themselves. After being cooped up together in a very small ship since midsummer, it's amazing that they agreed on anything. But there were still five more weeks of in-between time, crowded on the anchored ship and scouting locations before they decided on Plymouth and came ashore. The more I learn, the more I realize the English ha actually had quite a bit of information before they sailed. There were expeditions that had sailed to Newfoundland and down the main coast and returned. There were trading posts all along the coast. Those who came were almost all young, single, and male. They stayed for a while and then returned to England or Amsterdam. They were bold merchant adventurers. However, the settlement at Popham on the Kennebec River in Maine was quickly decimated by famine, and death in 1607. Further south, Jamestown in Virginia nearly failed that same year. In 1609, Henry Hudson sailed up the Mahicantuck River, now known as the Hudson, with, for the Dutch East India Company. So during their years in Leiden, in the Netherlands, the word on the street was that there was good land in this northern part of Virginia, along the river, Think somewhere around Newark International Airport. And so the religious community decided to go for it. What made the Mayflower different was the women and children, whole families traveling together. This was intended to be a permanent settlement. They came as a religious community and sold all they had for this endeavor. However, even all that they had wasn't enough to pay for the voyage and the provisions. So in order to pay for the trip, the separatists indentured themselves, agreeing to work for seven years in order to pay for their voyage, their land, and their homes. They were giving their money, seven years of their lives, and the future of their families. They were living Matthew 25. But instead of the owner, the master, the lord, the investor going away, the investor stayed put, and it was the servants who were the ones who took the journey, who took the money and supplies with them, with the goal of earning a return on the investor's wealth. We know the story, whether it's Matthew or Luke telling it, two of the servants invest the money and either double it, according to Matthew, or increase it tenfold and fivefold, according to Luke. It's either three months of wages in Luke, or a lifetime of wages in Matthew. But one of the servants is afraid and hides the money, buries it to keep it safe, so that he can return it intact to the investor. I find this owner's response really interesting that this one who was afraid should have at least invested the money with the bankers in order to earn interest. They had bankers 2,000 years ago. I mean, I wasn't expecting ATMs and online banking, but 
What would they have? What would it have been like? Modern banking as we know it originated in Amsterdam in 1609. Well, the Greek word for banker is really similar to the word for tables. Where have we heard that one before? Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers at the temple? That one's actually in all four Gospels. Clearly, Jesus was not happy with the money changers. I'm not so sure what he would think of the bankers. Well, whether you're thinking of the servants in Matthew or the pilgrims or yourself, how does it feel to be entrusted with someone else's wealth? I don't even do well with plant sitting or pet sitting, and I'm especially careful when driving other people. I know that if I were entrusted with a huge sum of money, the last thing I would do would be to gamble it. I might be a very cautious investor, but definitely would at least put the bulk of it in the bank to keep it safe, rather than hiding it in the sand somewhere. Well, that's where we are today, politically, environmentally, religiously. We've been entrusted with someone else's wealth, the democracy of the next generation. What gives me the most hope these days is that people have become more involved, recognizing that democracy has been entrusted to us in our hands and investing our time and our contribution is what we need to do for the future. We've also been entrusted with the climate and what gives me hope is awareness and green initiatives and carbon neutral goals and solar and wind power, electric cars, all the things that we realize we need to do if there is to be a climate in the future. It's similar with the pandemic. We've been entrusted with others' health and had to switch our individual understanding from a mask protecting ourselves to a mask protecting others. We've shifted from self-preservation to the common good. And here at First Church, we've been entrusted with the church of the next generation. Like the separatists, it's not all new territory. We know what we are called to do, we just have to do it. I've talked to many people over the past several months about finances and the economy and about how they're doing, about what's different and what's the same. Many are finding that their usual sources of income are reduced or threatened. They may have had to retire early or leave a job. Others have had no change. And some have had even more work as people's needs have shifted. Most of us have found reduced expenses in some areas, or at least some ways that we're spending money differently. Our priorities have shifted as well. Activities we've enjoyed are not available. Movies and restaurants, not an option. If we do get takeout, we're tipping differently, appreciative for the restaurant. On this Stewardship Sunday, we invite you to take this moment to Think about and look at your financial life with a new perspective that this unforgettable year has brought us. Evaluate what's important. Give differently. What do you want to be sure to support? What is it that you're doing without? What are your guiding principles about how much you choose to give? Are you like our church, contributing a percentage of your income to various charitable causes? Or do you give from the first fruits of your labors? When you support the church, you're not giving money away, 
but you are pooling a portion of your resources for our common work together. Ministry that we do together. Reaching out in mission together as a community. We've had to do our annual stewardship campaign differently this fall, asking you to communicate your financial pledge and your interests to us online. But we're having fun with it too, boxing up a thank you gift when you pledge your time, talent, or treasure for 2021, and showing our results week by week on the stewardship page of our website. We invite you to pledge your support of our faith community this week, so that we can include it in our total as we discuss and decide on our 2021 budget next week. This year, more than ever, we understand what it's like to live in an in-between time. Like the separatists, just offshore, with dreams for the future. Investing our lives in something we truly believe in. We're watching the next presidential administration take shape between now and the January inauguration. And we know with heavy hearts that we have more pandemic isolation to endure before we can gather together once again sometime next year. It is an in-between time, an extraordinary time. But extraordinary time can call for extraordinary response and extraordinary gifts. Through it all, we are being asked what we're willing to contribute to make it happen. As we commemorate the 400th anniversary of the arrival of our spiritual ancestors. We know we have much to learn, but we know as well that the community waits for us and asks us to invest our whole lives in Jesus' work, Jesus' ministry, and Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, King and Defender of the Faith. Having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our King and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents, solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body polity for our better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid, and by virtue hereof to enact, constitute, and frame such just and equal laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices from time to time as shall be thought most neat and convenient for the general good of the colony, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. In witness whereof, we have here undersubscribed our names at Cape Cod the 11th of November in the year of the reign of our sovereign Lord King James of England, France and Ireland, the 18th, and of Scotland the 54th. Anno Domine 1620.
Hi, First Church. I want to begin our announcements this morning by first thanking the entire stewardship crew, our chair, Stephen Weller, as well as Nancy O'Connell, Susie Longfield, Rob Morgan, and Karen MacArthur for your amazing sermon. And also a thank you to Lori Williams, uh, Dave Ketter, Davis Dyer, Peter Sykes for all the beautiful music, and Dan Smith. And I also wanted to take this time to thank Lexi Boudreau for uh, piecing and editing together this whole worship for us. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, we invite you to join us after church for Zoom coffee hour. We were planning on having Carlisle join us, uh, but he is still recovering from COVID-19. And so we ask you to continue to hold him in your prayers. As part of our Stewardship Sunday, uh, we are inviting you to pledge with us online and to please do so uh, before November 21st. Uh, because next Sunday, as Steve mentioned in the beginning of worship, we'll be dedicating those pledges together. And you can do so, uh, pledge, by uh, going onto our website and clicking on Worship, Music, and Spiritual Life, and then hovering over Stewardship and Giving, and you'll be able to, to click on Make a Stewardship Pledge. Uh, and you can pledge uh, both finances as well as your time and talents. Uh, and we want to thank everyone who has already pledged with us so far. As many of you know, uh, Hurricane Ada has hit Central America with devastating consequences. Our community minister in Latin America, Monica Marr, invites us as we can to help through the Friends Peace Teams. Uh, there is a link in our bulletin on page 10 if you are interested and able to make a donation. Uh, a good news update on UCC Medical Debt Forgiveness campaign. With our $2,000 donation, um, we joined this forgiveness campaign along many congregations, four associations, and over 100 households. And together we helped abolish $26.2 million in medical debt for New Englanders and first responders. And finally, Black Lives Matter Boston is supporting the uh, emergency needs of the Boston Area Youth Organizing Project. These resources will be used for housing, food, and COVID-19 related needs. If you are interested in donating uh, more information, it can also be found on page 10 of our bulletin. And now we will hear from David Kidder. Good morning, First Church. Notice is hereby given that a special meeting of First Church in Cambridge Congregational United Church of Christ will be held in its 384th year at 12.30 p.m. Sunday, the 22nd of November, 2020, via Zoom. First, to review and vote on the proposed 2021 annual budget of the congregation as re recommended by Executive Council. Second, to hear a report on efforts towards becoming an anti-racist church. No other business may legally come before the meeting by direction of executive counsel, David Kidder, clerk. Good morning, First Church. Will you pray with me, please? God of amazing grace, we pause now to listen, not so much to these words, nor to the songs we've heard or sung. Help us, God, to listen for that sweet, sweet sound underneath whatever else we may hear. Help us to listen for the sweet sound of your grace that whispers deep within us coaxing us, inviting us to let down our guards, to be still, 
to be met by your all-surrounding love. What is it that the sweet sound is telling us now? Is it that it's okay to be tired, to be sad, to be angry, to be anxious, to feel burdens or alone? Maybe it's saying it's okay to celebrate, to be joyful, to be grateful, even amidst all of the loss and the troubles. Is it asking us, where does it hurt right now? Let the sweet sound speak to us now with whatever questions or assurances we may need to hear. And let us hear, it's okay. And it's going to be okay. We pray for ourselves and for all who need the blessings of these words, God. For all who have COVID and all who worry, for all who are in hospital and all who are sick and all who are caring for them. We pray for all who grieve, all who are hungry, all who don't know where the next check is coming from or where they will sleep tonight or in the cold days ahead. We pray for all who are recovering from storms or in the midst of them. Let them, let us all hear the sweet, sweet sound of your grace, your courage, and your comfort. And in this season of preparation, forgiving, and for thanksgiving, how else is that sound calling us and coaxing us now? Is it asking us to take a rest? Is it asking us for what are we grateful? Is it calling us to give or to receive or both? Enlivened by your grace, God, with grateful hearts for that sweet sound still ringing and singing within, strengthen our hearts. Grant us hope and courage and confidence that yes, we can get through this. Yes, we will get through this together. Give us a sense of the infinite depths of your grace, of the abundance of your love, and help us to so receive and give as such. Keep us ever receiving your grace, God. Keep us ever giving thanks. Keep us ever giving of ourselves in response. As we imagine that sweet sound, God, let us imagine too and listen for the very voice of Jesus who taught us how to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning, First Church. This is Lori Williams, and I'm here with a stewardship moment for you. I have put off doing one of these for 20 years. I don't like to talk about it, and I don't really know why. Um, maybe it's because I wasn't really good at it for a while. Um, we would have all the best intentions of putting something in the collection plate when we came, but we were usually late or dragging things along with us to keep somebody small entertained and would realize that neither of us had a checkbook 
or any extra cash or a pen or any of the number of things a person needs to be actually able to put money in the collection plate. So there were lots and lots of good intentions. Then we graduated. You know, we got the little box with the weeklies and we would try to uh, make out our checks beforehand. So we'd bring them in and that helped some. But I have to tell you what has made my life better is the ability to um, donate electronically. Uh, my phone's always with me. It's easy to text. In fact, if I visit other churches, I forget to bring money because I think that I can text. Uh, usually you can, but it's not everywhere. The point is that I want to do this. I want to support the work that we do in the church and in the community. I realized a long time ago that I could have lots of good intentions, that there could be lots of things that matter to me that I want to do, but I'm one person with one person's time and one person's energy. And when I give to First Church, it gets multiplied. It gets multiplied and shared with more people than I thought possible. We take care of our staff, providing them with a reasonable wage so that people don't have to be in ministry and work multiple other jobs. We have programming that's fantastic for our children, and we are so fortunate to have more and more children to provide programming for as the years have gone by. We contribute to things in the conference and things in the city. We contribute to our neighbors and we help make things a little bit better. It's especially important for me to continue to give now. The economy is wonky. It will probably get better. I hope it gets better. Um, but for me personally, things have stayed pretty much the same, and I'm very grateful for that. That's not the, the case for everyone, and so it's especially important for me to be able to do my part and maybe do a little extra, because I'm sure all those times that I forgot or couldn't, but mostly just forgot, somebody else was there writing the check putting the money in the plate. So when you can't pray for yourself, the body prays for you. When you can't contribute for yourself, hopefully the body can contribute on your behalf until you can. And that's where I am today. And I'm happy to be there. And I will make my electronic pledge and Look forward to all of the great things that we will continue to do. God opens our eyes and our hearts to the tremendous needs of our community and the world. Each year we are invited to pledge our finances, time, and talents. With all of our gifts combined, we can expand the possibilities of Christ's work. We give thanks to all of you for all that you pledge and give and for the ways that we are called to work together in pursuit of justice and peace.
Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, for the gift of this community, we give you thanks. Accept our gifts and guide us to use them to bring love and justice, reconciliation and truth to a world that cries out in such great need. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Now may God bless you and keep you. May God keep all those whom you love, whether here or in some other place. May God be your companion and you be God's friend as you walk together all the days of your life. And at the journey's end, may you find the welcome of God's love. It keeps us all. Amen.